Hello and welcome to another episode of the Regal Podcast. Today we are joined by Der- Jeremy Dollinger, who is a fifth down black belt in karate and personal trainer. So, hello Jeremy, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. No problem, pleasure having you. So, what, what would you like to give a little bit of an intro to who you are, what you do, and sort of what brings you here today? Okay, so uh, my name is Jeremy. I've been doing a, 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 a martial arts instructor, been training for 21 years now. Um, my family has our own karate school and just recently got, got myself into a, a per- personal training as well. So uh, between, the, between the two professions, I guess, uh, uh, it gets to be a little bit busy, but it's all, uh, it's all everything that uh, I really like to do, actually. So, <laughs> uh, so my first question is, why martial arts? Why did like what, why did you get into that? Is that your family-run business that you just kind of then grown into it, or what was it? Yeah, so actually, uh, believe it or not, when I was a kid, I was uh, I believe I was five years old when that the the uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie came out, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's crazy because uh, after seeing the movie, I would not stop. I mean, kicking, punching, jumping, you know, flipping like all that crazy cool stuff that you saw in the movie. And uh, so my grandparents, uh, believe it or not, they looked and looked and looked and looked for a a karate school to get me into, you know, a martial arts school of some sort. And uh, just one day came across a a flyer and, uh, uh, you know, for martial arts and decided to check it out. I I believe I was 10 at this time. And sure enough, we got signed up two weeks later, I got the and uh, I don't know, we just kind of stuck with it. After about six years of training, my, my dad decided to open his own karate school. And then from there, you know, that's when I started my teaching and, and uh, took my uh, training a lot more serious. So that's, uh, that's what got me into it. And then I just, I can, what's it? No, go on, sorry, finish what you're saying. And so I basically, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> uh, I just continue to do my training, you know, uh, teaching. Uh, it's just everything. That's all I've ever known, really. So. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So, obviously, you said you've been training and practicing for 21 years. Did, did yes. That, that was that from when you started at 10 then? So, from 10 till right now, 21 years you've been practicing. Yes, absolutely. So, I'm 31 years old now. I started when I was 10, and I, I just haven't stopped. I haven't slowed down. It's been a five days a week thing, you know, so and sometimes on the weekends. So, uh, it's just been nonstop ever since. Hardcore then, yeah. <laughs> you obviously mentioned your dad as well, who started his own kind of dojo. Is it called a dojo? I might have got that wrong. Uh, yeah, so um, most styles call it dojo. We're, uh, we're a Korean style, so they call it uh, dojang or dojang, something like that. So, um, But yeah, we're, we're used to hearing dojo because uh, all the other people that we interact with. So. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. So, but yeah. So, my father obviously started his own dojang then. Um, mm-hmm. Does that so was he doing like practicing karate and martial arts before, or was this just kind of something he started to get into it? He just uh, he just got into it to 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 be able to do something with his kids, you know. I, uh, he started uh, two weeks after I started, and we got both of my uh, younger sisters involved as well. So, okay. so mm-hmm. really, the whole family, like literally. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I know your dad. He's a black belt as well, isn't he? Yep, he's a he's a fifth uh, fifth down black belt. He's about a year ahead of me though, and as far as our rank goes, so. Okay, um, cool. So it's up to you now to try and catch up to him. Uh, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> your your wife is actually a blue belt. Was the last I saw as well, isn't she? Yeah. Well, actually, since then she's been promoted to her uh, first degree black belt. Okay. And actually, believe it or not, this weekend. Um, she's been a black belt for two years now. Uh, she's been, uh, this weekend at eight months pregnant, by the way, eight months pregnant, she'll be testing for her second degree black belt. So very proud, very happy to see that. So <laughs> well done to her. that's fantastic. Uh, one <laughs> thing just to say quickly is congratulations, by the way. I don't oh, thank know if you. I've already said, but genuinely congratulations. Um, is this your first child or? Um, first for me, but uh, she does have two boys already that I consider my own. Um, One's a six-year-old and the other's 13. The 13 is also testing for his uh, second-degree black belt as well. So, 
Oh wow! Yeah, we're a whole <laughs> we're a whole family of uh, uh, martial artists. <laughs> we'll get started in your family anytime soon. Jesus. <laughs> well, we're all nice. I promise. So obviously, yeah, you've been training all of your, your both of your you know, your partner's children in martial arts as well, then. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So. How, how did you go about doing that? Because the reason I ask is because Harry's a new father as well to a baby. Boy. Okay. And I know that Harry's kind of interested in, well, I mean, in fact, Harry, you can say like, you know, are you, you're interested in teaching Teddy martial arts and sort of getting him into that side of things? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So my son was born in October. So only a couple months old and even I'm not quite crazy enough to say, right, let's get him straight into a dojo and <laughs> get, the, get the pads on and start training. <laughs> But I do believe that martial arts in any kind of form, whether that's boxing, kickboxing, karate, jujitsu, wrestling, whatever it may be, is just one of those things that it's vital. I think that everybody needs to learn it. Everybody needs to train. Maybe not do it competitively or anything, but just for your own mindset, your own confidence, your own kind of self-respect. I believe that everybody should learn it. So when would you say is the right age for me to try and start introducing Theodore into martial arts? Well, first of all, congrats on the new baby um but uh actually what we usually recommend is we have a actually at our karate school we have a program for three and four year olds so generally three four years old uh, we have a program it's called little ninjas and so i mean while they're learning to kick and punch they're also learning uh development so learning their left and right and also learning balance and coordination as well so um, it's, it's great for learning coordination and focus and discipline and all that as well. So generally my personal recommendation is maybe three and a half to four years old to get started. So, all right, brilliant. <clears throat> I will be reaching out to you in about three years saying, right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. That's interesting to see. So <laughs> yes. yeah, obviously, obviously like, you know, your, your specialty is karate. Mm-hmm. Why, why karate is basically my question. Again, I know Harry, for example, he has some opinions about what he believes the best martial art to be for different, different kind of uh, different areas of life and different situations. I've heard you know, right. guys like Jeff Rogan talk about this. So I'm curious, yeah, why karate for you? Well, for me, like I said, it's just something that, I mean, uh, that was the first, first karate school I went to and I just stuck with it ever since. I mean, um, I, I've looked into the uh, to uh, into other martial arts as well. I mean, uh, I personally have a have a newfound interest in uh, jujitsu and uh, uh, judo, like uh, grappling type of stuff. Just because, I mean, all throughout school, I did wrestling as well. So I have twelve years of wrestling experience, and you know, so there's that grappling there. But uh, I don't have a, 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 a. There's benefits to every style that you're gonna do. So I don't have a personal favorite. But like I said, the karate is just something that I've always done. That's just, that's just what I know. So, <laughs> yeah, j- just to jump in quickly and clarify, no, I don't have please. a specific opinion on which is the best martial arts. That's not valid. <laughs> right. What I've said in the past is I wrestled at school as well. Um, but in okay. the UK, wrestling is done totally differently. So Americans wrestle properly. In the UK, we don't. Um, <laughs> as the easy way to explain it, you guys win Olympic gold medals with broken necks for fuck's sake England we don't even <laughs> um great Kurt Angle reference to anyone who understands that so it's no nowhere near the same but I've tried to do a few charity uh what we call white collar MMA fights in the past and okay. I've done okay. two and I was going to do a third on this year and then COVID and an injury happened right and right. my logic was very much a case of I played rugby all the way through school I, I learned to wrestle in my like free time outside of school as well therefore for me to learn a new skill of striking is going to take me years and I'm not even going to pretend that I could get competent <laughs> in, a, in a short space of time. So instead I'll focus on, can I grapple? Can I pick this person up, put them on the floor, do a takedown and then kind of grab a joint and basically bend it or squeeze or whatever and get right, to win right. by submissions. First time I tried that, I got knocked out by me to the temple in about 12 seconds Ooh. going for a double edge. <laughs> Second time I managed to win with an armbar. So my logic was okay. always a nice. case of Absolutely, if you're a world-class striker, in and it comes to say self-defense, where there are rules, if somebody's coming at you in a street fight, I would love to be able to do the striking and just be able to leg kick essentially and destroy the person so they can't even stand. And I agree. <laughs> Absolutely. That. But equally, I feel if there's somebody who I'm I'm five ten, I'm about two hundred pounds. 
if there's somebody who's six six, three fifty, and they're just running at me, I'm not mm-hmm. going to be able to keep them at distance. So wrestling, jujitsu, in my head, makes more sense. Right, That's right, I absolutely. Don't know much about karate, so obviously you're you're the expert. Did you have kind of a differing, more expert opinion on that? Uh, I mean, mostly because of my expertise, you know, like, obviously, you know, like you said, if you had somebody, you know, much larger coming after you, uh, I mean, yes, I have the wrestling experience, but it's been, gosh, at least 10 years since I've, since I've been into it. So uh, my personal thing, you know, would be probably, you know, like, throwing like a low kick to somebody's knee something just to stop the, the other person so uh that i mean when i'm giving like self-defense classes you know because we do uh, uh, a lot of the people where, where, where i live it's uh right next to a a, a city it's pretty it's known to be pretty rough and tough around uh, around here so we're uh i give a lot of self-defense seminars to the general public mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things I always tell people is, you know, if, if you don't have any grappling experience, I mean, the best thing you can do is, I mean, go for the knees, go for, go for an easy target. So <laughs> that's uh, kind of where, where I'm at with that. Although, like I said, I, I do have a few students who are into like the grappling stuff. So I'm hoping to, hoping to dabble in that some more. So. <laughs> okay, cool. So you're kind of like like you say dabbling more into the world of real life application not just like learning it for a belt for example like actually right right you know self defend yourself defend your family if that's what you wanted to do that sort of thing absolutely and you get into the competitive side of things as well not not often because we're not a competitive style however um uh i'm a competitive person so i like to go out of my way and find tournaments and stuff like that to compete in this world also <laughs> yeah the high school uh, wrestling for that <laughs> cool i like it so yeah so how do forgive me for being somewhat ignorant here but how do like karate like co- competitive karate work then if it's not uh, like do you compete against each other as in like do you like literally fight each other or do you practice these like different styles or yeah, so uh, basically, uh, one of my favorite uh, tournaments to go to, it's our Nationals tournament over here uh, in the U.S. It's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They host it once a year. In fact, uh, just this past year, we obviously didn't get a chance to do it because of our uh, travel restrictions and, and whatnot, thanks to COVID. But uh, uh, it's an open tournament. So we have my, my style is Tung Sudo. And then there's other styles of, you know, Taekwondo, karate, you know, uh, showed kind of like all these different uh, styles and we get to basically have matches and basically it's it is it's like a fight however it's very controlled because most of us we have to get up and go to work the next day so um obviously we're not out to hurt each other it's mostly just to see how our you know our training would compare to somebody else's training you know so and really it's all about the person at that point so well, that's the first thing I was going to ask, which is, do you find certain styles dominate those kind of competitions? So those kind of competitions, I will say that the people that are hardest for me to beat are the Taekwondo styles, because I know there are a lot of other, like, sir, that train just to compete. And so uh, the ones I, I mean, I do well myself mostly because I'm a competitive person, but uh, mm. The ones I have problems with are the ones who train to compete. They're the ones sponsored by like Adidas and Nike, and you know they're 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 getting paid to go out there and compete and uh, and win uh, tournaments and matches and whatnot. So uh, usually for me, it's Taekwondo. Uh, those are the hardest one, hardest uh, martial artists to beat. <laughs> okay, um, obviously this is delving into the realm of the hypotheticals. But if do you think if it was a situation where people who trained your discipline, your style more specifically also had the funding and the and the sponsorships so that they didn't have to worry about also having a nine to five job or working or fitting training around their life and they could just essentially devote 20 waking hours a day every day to their their art and their discipline do you think it would be a fair fight do you think it's just the kind of the lack of stress of also having to have an, a job etc to take to pay the bills right yeah so i i do believe you know like you said if 
like let's say I had a, a a specific sponsor, you know, to cover all all of that, then I mean, yes, I could devote more of my time to training for competitions and and yeah. whatnot too. So it, it would it would make things a little bit easier. Um, however, like I said, you know, our specific style and our our uh, our karate school, uh, mm -hmm. it's more the focus is more of uh, self defense rather than the competitions. But we do have a couple just for fun. So. So that's what makes it more difficult to us is because we don't necessarily train to compete. We train for real life situations. So the thing I'm interested in though is like why is it that some very gangs or very joes, why is it mm -hmm. some like yours, for example, train to be more useful for real life, which in my personal opinion makes more sense. Why is it then that some people choose to do that and some people choose to just go down the competition route? Is it like, what is that difference? Like, why does that exist? I mean, well, uh, well, if you go to, to like South Korea itself, if you look, uh, Taekwondo is actually the, the national sport of South Korea. So Taekwondo is actually known as a sport rather than, I mean, I would still call it a martial art because uh, there are other taekwondo schools out there that that train for real life as well however um over there it's considered more of a sport uh whereas ours is considered a martial art you know so um but yeah i guess you know if, if some people have more of an interest in competing you know rather than learning self-defense <laughs> <laughs> and i mean i'm not saying that these people can't defend themselves because trust me i mean if you're learning how to fight then you're gonna obviously learn how to defend yourself but you know i would defend myself in a way i wouldn't use in a in a match against another martial artist you know what i'm saying so <laughs> okay so yeah it just depends the way that you look at it then and kind of what what you personally want to use it for right okay right so right now i don't do any martial arts and if i were to do martial arts and i am interested in doing martial arts i would want a martial art that helps me best protect myself and my future family in real life situations. Right. What do you think the first step I should be taking are? Should I get physically fit and then try and like look at different martial arts or should I just go straight into martial arts and train at the same time or what's your recommendation with that? Uh, my recommendation is uh, re research the martial arts school that you have in the area. So, and which uh, look into which one fits your pre preferences. And then after that, I mean, you don't have to be physically fit uh, right off the bat. That's uh, another good thing that comes with training in the martial arts is uh, it's, it's going to help you get physically fit. So that's, that's the number one excuse that I hear a lot of the times when I'm trying to get people to sign up is that, oh, you know, I'm not in shape enough yet, or I'll, I'll join, you know, when I lose a little bit of weight, it's actually, you know, you could join and then work on losing that weight or uh, getting physically fit at the same, you know, as learning how to defend yourself. So it's one of those things that for every style, uh, most people can do it. It's just uh, to the best of your ability. So, and then once you get started, the, the more and more you work on it, the better you'll, you'll progress. So. <laughs> Again, hypothetically speaking, obviously I am not obese by any means, but if there were, let's say, an obese person wanting to get into martial arts, wanting to get fit, do you think they would still be able to do, like, you know, do these different styles, or do you think that would then limit them to the point where they couldn't? Um, well, from, what, uh, from my experience, uh, people who are, you know, physically obese and, you know, very large, uh, most styles have a way to work with that person. So like in our, our, our school, you know, uh, right at the very beginning, you know, we, uh, of our classes, we have a bit of a warm up, you know, to get started, to get our, our, our muscles ready, you know, for, for the class. And then um, even the, uh, the larger people, if they can't do every part of the warm-up you know we we them. so that's sure everybody in that class is is um uh, going to be able to do it so okay so there's always a starting point that you can kind of just 
work from building a foundation and then get to whatever point they want to get to. Yes, absolutely. Okay, awesome. Absolutely. Awesome. So like I said, it's something almost anybody can do. So. Okay, cool. Why, why don't you think everybody's doing it then? Like, I know that everybody here understands that learning a martial art is super valuable and that most people, if not everybody, should be learning it. But what, why is that not a widespread thing? Why is that not a popular opinion? Right. Actually, I, I mean, I, I just don't think that there's a very big, uh, uh, there's not a lot of people who have an interest in learning. You know, I mean, in our school, we have a lot of kids, but we try to get the parents and, you know, teenagers and adults to join with them, you know, uh, and a lot of the, a lot of them just, they just don't want, they don't care. They, they'd rather, they'd rather, you know, sit off on the sidelines, you know, on their phones and, 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 you know, sitting rather than up and moving. So I don't know. I think it's just, people have a lot of excuses, mm -hmm. even though they know they could probably benefit from it. It's just they, it all comes down to they just don't want to do it. <laughs> so, yeah, so they're, as they're an adult, it's almost like they've had the time to just build these excuses in their head, whereas kids don't necessarily have that. One thing right, I wanted to ask, right. um, sorry for interrupting, but one thing I was curious about is I, I know, well, I can assume what America is like in the sense of at school. Um, you kind of, in, in high school, middle school, you play kind of baseball and football and basketball, et, et cetera, American football. Um, and here in the UK, it's, we play, as you'd call it, soccer. Um, if you go to slightly better schools, you play rugby and cricket and hockey, et cetera. Do you think there's a specific reason why we don't, even though we know that it's brilliant for discipline, we know it's great physical fitness, we know it's preparing you for your life by, you can learn a way to defend yourself in the horrible situation where you could fear uh, be mugged or whatever it may be. Do you think there's a reason why as schools, both in the UK, the US and kind of around the world, less so in Asia, because I think in Asia they do focus a bit more on it, which is why it's, are schools not kind of almost requiring participation in even something like boxing or wrestling, things like that? Right, so... Uh... Actually, yeah, uh, uh, some of our schools here do actually offer like martial arts. Uh, in fact, the schools that we're closest to uh, in our in our city, uh, mm -hmm. we, we, we can actually go in there and teach, but it, it's not a part of the like the school sports programs. You know, it's an extra like little side thing. But um, I think it just has something to do with, you know, like again with physical contact and you know we are throwing punches and kicks at each other so and obviously you know some kids aren't gonna take that you know and, and do it responsibly you know they're, they're gonna go out of the way their way to try to hurt some people so i think that is the probably the main reason um but and again i think it also goes into the whole like just not not enough interest, you know. I think if a lot of people re started to request it, you might start to see it more. But as of right now, it's it's not a huge thing. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Then. Um, okay. Cool. So, obviously, you've been doing martial arts a long time. So, firstly, would you say it's affected your mindset? I'm going to assume yes, but equally. How do you think it has affected your mindset, not just with martial arts, but in your wider life, like with your business, with your family, with your children? How right. do you think it's affected you? So uh, that's one of the best parts about it is uh, when, when we train right from the get go, we tell people you know, you're training to develop every aspect of your life. So and not only your self-defense, but your, you know, your, your, your discipline, your focus and your your ability to, you know, have better confidence. So um, for me, it's affected my confidence. I mean, as a teenager, especially I was, I was that quiet kid, you know, quiet, shy kid sat in the corner, you know, headphones on wouldn't, you know, uh, I wasn't social. So until I started like actually getting out there, putting myself out there to teach and to, uh, 
to help other people. So that's, a, a, again, it's a big part of our style. Once you hit a certain level, uh, we make it a responsibility that, okay, you go help this person, you go help this person. So really it's brought me out of my shell. It's made me a more confident person, you know, as somebody with a, a learning disability, you know, I grew up with a learning disability and uh, again, it, it's, it's affected my, my school, but after, you know, learning to focus and, and, and help others, I, I think I've been able to overcome that. And again, we, we, we do our best to help other people overcome their, you know, maybe learning disabilities as well. So um, for me, it's, it's affected that greatly. Um, in fact, I, uh, I met my wife at the karate school. She signed up with her son and uh, we hit it off from there. And so our family life is, you know, excellent. Um, it makes our, our, our communication and everything is great. So again, it, 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 for me, the most important thing that I got out of it, uh, aside from the, the physical, the physical fitness and the self-defense is the, the confidence and the, just a positive mindset, so. Do you think then, well, obviously you say confidence is a big thing for you. So do you think that like learning a martial art in the way you have could actually overcome some more serious like mental health issues, you know, like anxiety, even depression? Like, oh, absolutely, awesome. absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's scientifically proven that exercise in general can, it can uh, help with your anxiety and depression. So, um, that's a, a big thing with us is, you know, not only are we working on self-defense and, and all that, but uh, the exercise alone, uh, it's, it, it goes hand in hand. So that, and then being able to, you know, work with the group of like-minded people all the time, you know, who have this, the, you know, the same similar, you know, either, you know, depression, ang anxiety, or, you know, uh, learning disabilities or whatever it may be, you know, uh, it just, it, it, it helps greatly with that, I think. So um, I've, again, uh, personally seen it, you know, help people in that area of their life as well. So, hmm, yes. Interesting then. So one thing I'm kind of curious about is if you didn't know, Harry is a dating coach, relationship coach. Okay. And Obviously, like he, some of the stuff he talks about is you know overcoming social anxiety, especially when right. it's the women in this case or other people potentially. Right. So, do you think, from your kind of perspective, Harry could somehow incorporate, like, um, recommend or incorporate like martial arts in actually helping people get the like partner that they want as well? So, like, would that go hand in hand nicely? Absolutely. Like I said, I mean, uh, just the obviously as he might know that the confidence is a huge thing and uh coming from somebody uh, like myself who, who hasn't been very confident in most of my life until like i said until i started teaching um that's uh, a huge thing that's going to help bring that out of a person so you know if you point them in the direction of a martial arts school especially one that you might know that is going to you know, push you in that direction of maybe helping others, um, then yes, yeah, it's, it's going to bring that confidence out of a person and it's going to help with that. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to piggyback on that, one of the, you know, some of my private clients, Jordan, one of the things I do push quite hard is the need to go and become more physical. And I don't mean yes. physical in by just weight training, but I do actively encourage specifically in martial art and some kind of social sport. So in my case, it was rugby, and for a lot of other people, it's football or soccer in the UK. Right, right. And it's absolutely everything you were just saying then, which is you're not only meeting like-minded people or similarly-minded people when you're taking a martial art class, but also you're encouraged to help other people out. You're, you've got kind of bands with each other. You're, you're learning all these social skills in a setting that doesn't feel social. So you're kind of not having these social anxiety, you're not having these kind of panic attacks making you nervous about entering because you're just going right. to learn a skill and kind of without even noticing, you're kind of sneaking in all this brilliant mindset, discipline, focus, all these great things. Absolutely. And I think the best thing to overcome 
any kind of anxiety fundamentally. Um, well, we talk about immersion therapy quite a lot on the podcast, but one of the other things is simply the fact that as you do difficult things, you become, you store that and you remember, well, I overcame this challenge. I overcame this. I moved this heavy thing. I did this heavy thing. I tackled this mental block I had. As you achieve more and more of those, you build up this kind of repetition of this thought process in your head saying, well, I've succeeded in the past. I had to deal with this and I overcame it. This physically hurt and I pushed through that pain barrier. Uh, whatever it may be all of those repetitions stacking those wins back to back you're just going to fly forward in your confidence and that is one reason why I recommend to everybody in the UK if you are a school boy or your school child level you should be playing a sport like rugby over say soccer because I think it's more physical it's more teamwork orientated whereas in soccer one player can dom can drag the team forward to the victory in rugby you need 15 guys all of whom are working hard if somebody doesn't pull their weight, you lose. And I right, think the same right. kind of thing applies for martial arts in that sense of there's nowhere to hide. <laughs> it is on you to do your best. You can't look and wait for the star player behind you to do well. You need to dig deep and bring that out of you. And I think that is transformative to everybody. And the younger you can learn that, the better in my eyes. Absolutely. I 100% agree. Yeah, fantastic. So another thing I want to talk about is I know somebody who trains in Muay Thai and they actually moved to Thailand to train from directly from a master like one on one what are your thoughts training one on one from a master like that as opposed to going to like a dojo like you sort of do right so you'll definitely see a lot more benefit to training one on one with a with a master or an instructor or whatever it may be um, especially one straight from, obviously, you know, uh, it comes from Thailand, you know, so, and he goes straight to Thailand and train. So, um, he's going to see a, a definitely more improvement than he would, you know, in like a class type of setting. Um, in fact, that's actually, uh, I do have, uh, two clients that I work with out of our own karate school. Uh, one's a 13 year old boy and the other is a 55 year old man. And they both wanted to get better at their, uh, their, their, their fighting in general. So uh, we do it twice a week. We gear up and we, you know, we do that one-on-one. -on -one and they're uh, at their level. They're so far ahead of everyone else who should be at their level just because they have that extra one-on-one extra -on -one training. So, yes, you are going to benefit more from, uh, from like the one-on-one -on -one, like personal training or coaching um, than you would in a big class type of setting. As far as your martial arts skills go, uh, however, you know, like the, uh, the, the, the confidence aspect, I mean, it's going to make you more confident in your technique, but um, being more confident and social, you'll, you, you would need that classroom type setting. So with more people. Okay. So it depends what you're kind of doing it for. If you're going to improve your overall confidence, then by all means, right. that classroom setting, build that confidence right. in front of a group and and then continue right. your actual skills, as opposed to that one-to-one -one mentorship. Right. Okay, cool. It's very similar to, you know, like, like you kind of said before, Harry, like dating coaching, it's very similar to like business coaches that I've kind of worked with in the past. It's, yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. I like it. So going way back then, you obviously talked about your partner is actually you know, trained with you and that's kind of how you met. How, how do you think, and if you think, your relationship has improved and strengthened or changed in any way by the fact that you both sort of train together by the fact that the entire family is involved in what you live and what you all live i mean I, I it's definitely brought us closer in a way because i mean it's something we both have the same uh the same interest in something you know so and like i said we've made it just kind of a lifestyle thing so it's it's just what we do every day. So after I'm finished with uh, my day job as a personal trainer, uh, I'll go home, we get ready, and then we go up to the karate school. That's our, that's our daily routine. So it's just something that we all get to do together as a family. And like I said, I, I think it's just brought us so much closer than it would if, you know, we weren't doing a, an, an activity like that together. So how would you balance? training five we say five days a week that you train 
Right. How, how would you balance training five days a week and, for example, when you're when is your like raising your foot at the same time when they're feeding to train themselves? Right. So <laughs> that's when uh, I'm gonna have to <laughs> figure out as we go. You know, it's just kind of learn as you go sort of thing. But uh, I'm definitely gonna have to take not a ton of time off, but a little bit of time off to get that situated. Um, I don't think I'm gonna be able to be there you know, for five hours a day, but, uh, uh, I'm still gonna, we're still gonna try to make it up there as much as we can, obviously her with the baby and she's going to have to take at least six weeks off to heal. Uh, but, um, yeah, so that's, again, it's going to be a learn as you go sort of thing. Um, but, uh, it'd be interesting to sort of speak to them then as well and try and like, right, absolutely. manage to get on with that. So, yes. Uh, Obviously, you kind of said that your wife is going to be training to get her, for lack of like a better way to call it, her second down, did you say? Second down, yep. Um, actually, this this coming Sunday. So she'll be eight months pregnant, and she's going to be testing for that second down uh, black belt. So, and it's a, it's a long it's a long day. It's a, it's about a six hour long test. Wait, say that again. How is that possible? Is it? How, how is it possible that she's trained and like literally ranked on her second down while like right so there's obviously like uh we make it possible for people with specific limitations mm -hmm. so uh, uh a lot of the stuff that we do i mean we do have a lot of things that w where we throw you to the ground or we put you in some sort of a chokehold or or whatever but there's some things that obviously she can demonstrate on other people, but can't necessarily be demonstrated on her. So I can say, okay, uh, you can take this person and, you know, sweep them to the ground. Whereas the other person, however, is going to have to move, move over with another person so, because she can, obviously can't be taken down like that. But uh, so there's, there's things she, most things she can do, but the little things like that, she, she obviously has to stray away from. So mm -hmm. I, did, I just assumed that when you were past a certain point of pregnancy, you just couldn't do martial arts. But right. So we uh, we definitely consulted our doctor. <laughs> uh, we asked the doctor, you know, what she thought. And she said, you know, it was a it was a great thing to, you know, stay active for as long as you can. Um, and she she asked, you know, what type of activities that we do. And she says, OK, you can do all of that, you know, up until the day, basically the baby's ready to come. Um, just don't, obviously you can't overdo it and, uh, she can't be tossed around basically. So <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. do you think the fitness that she's gained from practicing martial arts will improve the health of the baby? Like, do you know if that's the thing, like, you know, the health that she got will pass on to the baby as well? Right. I'm not exactly 100% sure if that's a thing. However, uh, just with us being like a fitness, you know, martial arts family in general, you know, when, when baby's ready to, you know, get on the mats, then we're gonna, we're gonna allow for him to get on the mats. So <laughs> um, I, I am not exactly sure if, if that'll help, you know, right when the baby's born, but <laughs> okay, cool. we'll see. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, okay. So also, what, is your dojo open right now? Like, can you be open because of COVID? We can be open, but we can only have uh, a certain percentage of capacity. So right now we're only allowed up to 25% of the ca building's capacity. Mm -hmm. So for us, uh, that would be about 28 to 30 people in the building allowed. And we can't, you know, unless the other person gives permission, we're not doing anything with contact. So uh, most of the throws and the takedowns, the joint locks, the chokes and everything that we do, um, we won't practice unless, uh, there, you know, there's specific people who are there say that it's okay. Let's, 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 let's do it. So, but there are still a bunch of restrictions and limitations that, uh, we're, we're just not going to touch until everything is okay to do so. Mm -hmm. So let's assume that you, you know, like you can't get into your dojo, Beijing, and you know, there's, or even worse, there's no, there's none around in your like sort of local area. Right. How would you recommend somebody goes about training, either training themselves at home or just generally training at 
Uh, mostly what I would recommend is, um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there on YouTube, you know, like the tutorial videos. And in fact, I do a bunch of tutorial, uh, tutorial videos on my TikTok, and, Mm -hmm. and, and I'm trying to get a YouTube thing going, uh, but it's just, you know, uh, I got a lot going on already. So it's going to take a little bit longer to, to, to do, but however, if you can get let's say somebody who's already, you know, like a certified instructor to do like a one-on-one type of Zoom thing, or if you can do a virtual class somehow, um, that would be better than, you know, trying to do it on your own. So uh, in fact, when the whole uh, shutdown first happened uh, with COVID, we went to, everything had to be virtual. So we did everything over Zoom, you know, we did we broke the classes up into as many as many classes as we could, so they weren't overcrowded on Zoom. And uh, you know, we just we uh, we had to do our best in that way. So obviously, there's some things though that you can't practice, you know, un- unless you have somebody willing to, you know, let's say throw a punch at you or you know get taken down by you. But otherwise, uh, yeah, the the best thing is going to be probably finding somebody who's willing to teach over uh, over zoom how would that work then over zoom just out of curiosity so obviously like uh like you sent me the the invite link right so uh, at our school what we did is uh we have a private facebook group where you know i'll post training videos and tutorials and stuff like that for those who need a little extra help on in some areas but uh we also will post a zoom link like saying okay you know for for beginners you know beginners intermediate advanced you know we're going we're doing a zoom basically class today at you know five o'clock p.m and uh here's the link basically so we, we, we reach out to people to give them the link. However, if you're looking for a class, I mean, you might, th- that would be something you'd have to probably either research on Google or uh, try, to, try to just find somebody who knows what they're doing so that they can, uh, you know, work with you on that. So just quickly then, on the topic of finding somebody who actually does know what they're doing, um, I know that Joe Rogan's pointed out repeatedly that um, there are a lot of like fake jujitsu instructors out there and there's a lot of crappy boxing coaches, et cetera. Do you have the same kind of problem um, in your disciplines you find, or do you think it's more only really, you only really find people who are good because it's not the same kind of uh, juggernaut that say boxing is with hundreds of millions of dollars being given to prize winners, et cetera. Right, so uh, in our specific discipline, there are a couple, but it's not as overly crowded as, you know, let's say boxing or, you know, MMA gyms or, or, or something like that, you know, with the fake jujitsu and whatnot. I, I, I see it all the time though on online and, and actually in person, you know, so um, it's definitely something you have to look out for, but if you're looking for a more traditional style, like Tung Sudo or, you know, like karate or Shotokan or any of those styles, uh, most of them, if you can usually look up their credentials or like if they belong to a specific organization, so if they belong to a very large, you know, organization known either nationally or internationally, then that's mm-hmm. usually how you can tell if they're legitimate, you know, instructor. So, <laughs> okay, whereas uh, like we have a, we, we have a guy actually just a couple miles down the street from us. Uh, who's he claims that he teaches uh, jujitsu and one of my uh, jujitsu students actually went in there to uh, to check it out and said that the guy was a fake so it's I mean it's everywhere but uh, Mm. he does he also doesn't belong to any larger organization so you you have to look for that larger organization to make sure you know that it's a legitimate instructor so all right, that makes a lot of sense. So kind of like with everything, just do your background research. Uh, Jordan, can you say that again? I didn't hear you. Sorry, internet kept me mic on. 
Uh, what was your question, Jordan? Was a bit of a guess. Like, how do you become part of those larger organisations? Do you like? Is there an application you fill out? Do you have to do like a demonstration of your sort of skill level? Or... So basically, uh, the, the the whole reason I got started is the 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 school that I started with was already in this larger organization. And so if you come up through the ranks in this organization, become an instructor, uh, you can open your own, you know, school, karate school uh, within the organization. Uh, and then you're accredited with, uh, uh, with these people and they, they have their own set of requirements. So for me, uh, as a fifth Don, in our style, uh, once you become a fourth Don Black Belt, you're considered a master instructor. And to be, you know, to be able to, to test for that, you have to test in front of our organization president and technical advisory committee, basically. Um, so you have to, everything has to be done through their standards. So, uh, and we do, we have schools all over the world uh, that, I mean, well, you know, for instance, we have a school in uh, Cardiff, Wales. And so somebody from our technical advisory committee will actually fly all the way out there uh, just so that they can, you know, witness these people and, and make sure that they're like a, a, a legitimate before, you know, letting them become a, a master instructor or an instructor in, that, uh, in general. So. It really is done by the book. Like you have all the officials come down, you have all the official like rankings and stuff. Really good. Right. <laughs> I, bet that's in, I bet that's an intense day. Is it is mean? actually. So for mine, uh, see, the way we did it is uh, to become a certified instructor. So you can open up your own school and you can start teaching. Uh, you have to be a second don, and you have to test to become a certified instructor. And that's usually just regional. So uh, I can test somebody to become a certified instructor, but they have to have at least six years of training in and at least two years of assisting and, uh, you know, helping with the ins uh, instructors in, in class. But uh, to become a master instructor, you have to have, I believe it's at least 12 or 13 years of training, all these extra years of, you know, teaching and assisting, and then somebody from our uh, corporate, you know, headquarters has to uh, make sure you're up to their standards. So, yes, yeah, so, like you said, it really is done by the book. So very strict. So, but usually any big uh, worldwide organization uh, in the martial arts will have something similar to that, so. Okay, fair enough. So it is when you sort of test for different belts, different ranks, is that in a similar format to say competitions with like so you just kind of demonstrate your skill in different competencies and then kind of get ranked and judged on it right so basically the way we do it is uh everybody starts no matter what no matter what uh age you know or experience you have in our style everybody starts at, at beginner everybody starts with the white belt and then we do our testings every three months so after you started you test in three months with your group and uh basically you have to show us everything you've learned in that last three months right so to test from that white belt to that yellow belt you know we have our set of basic blocks punches and kicks that we show you your basic uh self-defense techniques that we show you and uh and your your traditional uh forms as well so uh and that's a process like i said that we do every three to six months actually um and that's how you would rank up and, and that that's usually the same in most styles. So. so can you can you only rank up once per three month or six month period? Like you couldn't go from a white belt to a black belt or something stupid in like that's correct. Um I've I mean I've known other schools uh to do that. You know, for instance, uh uh there's a again, another a, a Taekwondo school up the street who, you know, for them, it only takes you like maybe two years to get your black belt. Whereas for us, it takes you four years because there's so much to learn. But for them, it's mostly about the, the competition part. So it's just like, 
the better your skill level, the, the, the quicker you rank up. So in ours, uh, it's, it's, it's all done by the books. You have to do it uh, the way we have it set. And like I said, for most traditional styles, it's the same way. So you say it takes about four years to get your black belt. Is that yes. commonly done? Or is that a case of that is the shortest time frame possible, but the vast majority of people can't learn it that quickly. It takes them eight, 10, 12 years. Right, so in, in our school, uh, it's common to get your black belt between four and six years. Four years is the absolute earliest. Um, but I mean, because like, obviously, like if it, let's say you're testing from white to yellow belt and you're not ready, either you fail that yellow belt test or you're not ready to test, then you have to wait another three months after that. So it, you know, it does take an extra amount of time for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, yeah, for, for us, uh, it's common to get your black belt in about four, between four and six years. And with how many, how much training is that entailing? Is that once a week or three times a week, uh, five times a week? We generally ask that people try to make it at least twice a week. And our classes are an hour to 45, between an hour, uh, 45 minutes and an hour long <laughs> per class. Um, and we, we do multiple classes a day. So, and they can come to multiple classes a day if they would like, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's the minimum is two days a week for mm -hmm. one class per, per day. So. Okay. So about two hours, two hours of, a week kind of thing. Is Correct. What most people do for. Right. Okay, that, that kind of makes the most sense to me because especially if you've got a job as well, then it fits in nicely around that job because then you can you know commit an hour in the evening if they're running in the evening rather than it takes up like let's say five days of your week kind of thing. Right, right. Hmm, cool. So as you kind of touched on earlier, you not only like love and practice martial arts every day, but you're also a personal trainer. And yes. For a quick from your website, you also sell merch, I believe. So how have you kind of made that transition just from pure martial arts master to business thing? Right. So basically uh, I started selling the merch because uh, I do a, like a cardio kickboxing style fitness class. Uh, and the more people that started to do it, the more it became like a community thing. And, you know, everybody actually, it was, wasn't even my idea. Uh, people had just said, you should, you should make t-shirts. You should make, you know, uh, like joggers, like that type of stuff. So I just did it, you know, as a, as like a side thing to like, I'm not even, I wasn't even trying to, to make any money off of it. It was just because these people wanted to show that they were representing our, you know, fitness class. But now I've turned, uh, I call it JD fitness. It's kind of my, uh, my personal training business. So, um, uh, people can, you know, either support that by either buying merch or if they're a client of mine, you know, uh, we work out together. And sometimes, like I said, if we work out together, like I'll just, uh, I'll hand them a t-shirt, you know, or, or whatever. But uh, uh, more and more people started to see the, the shirts and the joggers and everything and started asking, hey, where can I get those? So that's where I kind of came up with. I just made it easy little like big cartel, uh, you know, Shopify sort of store where people can uh, quickly order it and have it sent out. So uh, that, and because my, uh, my TikTok account is actually more recently started picking up speed and, and, and blowing up pretty quickly. So um, even people on there said, Hey, I like that shirt. Where can I get it? So I made a whole like merch link, you know, that I put in my, in my bio and I'll, you know, it, the end of some of my videos, I'll say, Hey, get these joggers through the merch link in my bio, basically. So <clears throat> it just became like a side thing. And all of a sudden now I'm, <laughs> I'm generating income from it. So it's, it's kind of cool. <laughs> Fair play. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, obviously you said that you've kind of recently gone on to TikTok, which I've seen your TikTok. I absolutely love it. Um, especially the videos where you're beating up Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So actually the, uh, the Bob actually stands for body opponent bag. So uh, we just shortened it to Bob. And 
I, I, I first started off with just kind of just kicking on them, but then uh, more and more people started to interact with those videos. So I thought, how funny would it be if I if I had a beef with Bob, you know? So <laughs> uh, I just kind of made that into a thing that I do now. So I'll I'll yell at him and then punch him or kick him or whatever. So <laughs> I just turned it into something fun. But then yeah. Um, do a lot of uh, other stuff, you know, tutorials. And most of it was just because I'm a big show off, right? I can do these kicks, so why not take video and show everybody, hey, you can learn these kicks too, you know, so. <laughs> I actually think that's kind of brilliant though. Because one of the things we said earlier when we were talking about like participation with adults, with teenagers, with kids, is the fact that it isn't kind of this, that almost seems that because it's not discussed very often in the public eye, people don't kind of look for it. They don't pressure their parents to go take part unless you maybe see the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie. Um, right. So it means that there isn't kind of an interest in taking part so people don't go out and discover it and they don't realize just how truly brilliant it is for you. I feel right. like that kind of thing of just a fun TikTok where you're going, look at this awesome kick that I can do that no other human being on the planet who hasn't trained can possibly do. <laughs> And that kind of story, and like like you said, this kind of fake beef with Bob, but that kind of stuff is just really right. entertaining. And I'm hoping, and I'm, I'm sure you'll know better than I, but I'm sure it's kind of sparking interest in kind of younger people or just people in general who go, you know what, I never really thought about training. That actually looks awesome. Let's take part. So I think you're doing right. a great thing, even if that wasn't the goal. I think you're doing really good. <laughs> well, oh, thank you. Yeah, it, it, it originally wasn't the goal. It was just to mostly show off these kicks. But then uh, more and more people started asking, like, how do you do that? So eventually it turned into tutorials and such. And then uh, then I got to thinking, like, I could possibly make something out of this, you know, so whether it's uh I mean, I can maybe coach these people or right now I'm working on uh, uh, video courses on how to do like the, the basic, basic kicks for those who are just wanting to uh, get into it and start learning. So uh, I, I've, I've been uh, dabbling in that recently as well. So, so yeah, what started off as fun turned into something <laughs> I found out that I can possibly uh, monetize. So. <laughs> It kind of takes us back to something Jordan and I discussed in a previous podcast where, where we did like an FAQs video and somebody asked about starting a business. How do I know what product to sell, what business, what service to offer? And right, we right. had slightly different views on it, but we kind of settled with the best kind of route is let the market tell you what they want. Just go do fun things that you find great. And when right. the market says, no, no, I'll pay you to do that. That's when you go, right okay i've got business double down and go in with just pure intensity and work ethic and just drive just go for it absolutely and i find it easier to do uh business that way as well too with uh with covid being the way it is you know like we can't have a lot of people in person at our karate school now so um to me that was an opportunity to say okay uh i can teach you but let's do it virtually, you know, through Zoom or whatever. So like I said, it turned into a way to, to, to monetize this stuff that like I already knew how to do and now all these people are wanting to learn how to do it, so. Cool, cool. So yeah, it's literally, you know, you're just doing what you're passionate about, what you love, and it just so happens that you've now been able to turn that into an income. So that's fantastic. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, another thing I wanted to talk to us about with your TikToks and your Instagram videos is like with your kicks, you have a lot of fucking power behind those kicks. <laughs> That's <so> scary. <laughs> Do you know how much power your kicks have? Like, have you actually had it tested or measured? Like, I don't know how you do that, but. So basically what we do is to, to measure power basically behind a lot of our techniques, kicks, punches, uh, any sort of strikes. You see it in a lot of movies, you know, it's, uh, you know, people like breaking boards or whatever. So what we do is we take, a, it's a, like one inch pine and it's cut into a big uh, 10 inch, basically rectangle. And uh, basically, uh, if you can break one of those, it's basically equal to one rib. 
And so the way we test that is, okay, so I can do this sidekick or whatever, but how hard can I do it? So we we will actually take these pieces of wood and we'll stack them together. So if you can do like three or four of these boards stacked together, I mean, it's a solid kick, but it's very, very hard to do. So um, not only that, it takes, uh, it takes uh, targeting as well. So uh, if you don't kick it right in the right spot, it's not going to break. If you don't kick it hard enough, it's not going to break. So that's how we test it. Um, otherwise, uh, you would have to go to one of those uh, specialty labs that, you know, tests, you know, how much power is, you know, behind something. So. <laughs> oh, cool. Just out of interest then, how many can you break? I've done up to six uh, with a sidekick. And then uh, our, our most powerful uh, strike is with our elbow. And I've done eight with an elbow. Jesus now, Christ. the hard part is the the person having to hold that many boards i mean my hands are only so big so i can hold maybe five or six of them but any more than that's going to be really hard not to mention they're heavy so uh we actually uh one of my students made this thing where you can stack the boards on it and then he's got these uh basically rubber bands that hold it to the to 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 the mount i guess it's a mount um you got the rubber bands that hold it to the mount and then all he's got to do is just hold it up and from there <laughs> have at it <laughs> so scary though eight with your elbow yes <laughs> so i believe there there used to be a, a show called fight science uh and they tested this theory or this uh with a mma fighter uh, a, a ufc fighter you know how much power is behind your elbow and you know they they used one of those meters that tests your power and he actually did it so hard that uh i believe the first time he broke it and then the second time um basically there was enough power to actually crush a human skull so <laughs> there's a lot of power behind those those elbows and those knees and those sidekicks so jesus yeah as if that not happen in mma fights in UFC then you've got a UFC fighter who can physically crush a human skull with his elbow how did he not do that in a fight uh to be honest I think it's uh depends on the skill of the other person so I mean I've seen broken legs and broken ribs and I mean I've personally I've had a rib broken in a, in a match before but uh um as far as the elbows go I mean <laughs> I really it's I don't know how how nobody's actually gotten their you know skull broken or you know brain damage for sure you know <laughs> talk to a person who's been fighting you know professionally for 20 years and see you know see how much brain damage they have but <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. I mean that's just crazy yeah I, I do think it's one thing being able to pause i think it was bass root in that episode but being able to pause line yourself up and then follow through against right. the board that's not moving it's not going to flinch it's not tensing versus right. say for example you've got full mounts and you're dropping like a 12 to 6 elbow or something absolutely yep. talking and moving their head and you're not getting perfect but right. it means exactly like everyone's always said in boxing there's always a boxer's chance anybody at any moment one lucky strike in the right place and right with anyone Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah, so the chance is just sort of so small that, like, you know, because everything needs to line up perfectly, like you say, it's that boxer's chance. Right. Yeah. Scary, though. So <laughs> obviously, you've got, like you say, you've got that risk of somebody who's been doing it professionally for, like, 20 years, like, they are you know, susceptible to brain damage or other injuries. How do you, like, do you think it's kind of still worth then training in martial arts even with that increased risk of like brain damage or breaking ribs or breaking legs or right so as far as like the other aspects you know the self self-confidence the discipline and and uh everything else that you get from it coordination um that's what makes it worth it you know continuing to train however for me uh i mean i've done a a couple of full contact fights before like i said i've had a rib broken and actually had had a rib broken twice 
But uh, 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 after having that happen, so those guys are getting paid to fight, <laughs> right? So that's a, a, a big deal for them. However, you know, me who's doing it voluntarily, which most people who train in the martial arts are doing it voluntarily. Um, and they, you know, they have to, they have to go to, go to work the next day or whatever. So, uh, I mean, I continue to train not to be able to, again, fight for competition, but for my life in general. So, and my, and my family's life and to stay healthy. So. So in terms of that risk quickly, just piggybacking on Jordan's question, is it one of these things where if you're not doing the competitions and you're not physically fighting to score points against somebody else, the risk of injury is a lot lower. Obviously there's a risk of injury standing up. You could pull a muscle, but in terms of the actual training process and in terms of the actual um, moving through the grades and uh, going through uh, the process and learning, uh, earning, achieving your different belts, the likelihood of injury is, I'm assuming, relatively low compared to essentially weight training or playing a competitive sport, et cetera. I assume right, it's yeah. safer. It is, it is safer than, you know, doing it competitively. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, like you said, there's always that risk of, you know, like uh, rolling my ankle or, you know, if somebody gets me in a joint lock too far, you know, they could possibly break my wrist or my arm, however, you know, there's uh, the, the, the risk, risk is definitely lower. Okay, fair enough. I'm, I'm kind of curious then, like obviously you said you've actually broken your rib twice in competition. Yes. Is, uh, sorry, are like karate competition, martial arts competitions, are they more like rugby where if you break a bone or you get injured, you just kind of suck it up and carry on? Or is it more like soccer where if you get injured, does it just like, uh for the most part i mean it's you you basically just suck it up and carry on i mean that's what i had to do uh sometimes i mean yes it's the end of the fight so uh for me actually the first time it happened it was a grand champion fight and we were in overtime and it was kind of one of those things like next point win sort of thing and i just lunged at the guy he stuck his foot out and i ran right into it and you know, that was the end of the fight. I, w I wouldn't have been able to get up from it, you know, anyways, you know, after having a rib broken, especially the first time ever breaking a bone, you know, it hurts. So I wasn't about to do it again. However, the second time um, I was able to continue fighting, you know, it was the middle of the match. And I mean, they'll ask you, like, can you continue? Then if you can, you just go. So. <laughs> I think right. one of the reasons I'm like that's one of the reasons I definitely prefer rugby to like soccer and why I'm a fan of martial arts because it's there's kind of no bullshit. It's not like a oh you know you've got a slight bruise on your elbow or you put yourself you know get like go to the hospital. It's just you know if you can get up if you can still carry on breathing and you want to you can just carry on. Absolutely. <laughs> What's the worst injury you've ever seen sustained during a martial arts competition? Okay, so uh, there's there's two that I can think of right off the top of my head, and uh, as a master instructor in competition, we have to we have to dedicate some of our time to helping run the tournament as well. So I have to be a uh, referee for matches a lot, and so the first one was uh, we were in uh, Pittsburgh for a for a tournament, and the, uh, there was a guy fighting another guy and he went to go punch him. Well, when he punched, he, his wrist rolled over, over just like this, you know, just enough to where, when he made contact, uh, you saw his, his entire wrist just bend. And then, uh, right here in his forearm snapped, like you could just see it. And when he, you know, after he pulled his arm back, it was just kind of dangling there, which was, it was awful to see. It was, it was bad. So obviously, you know, that end of the match right there uh, and this was you know an adult men's division you know fighting division and you know a lot of the times they fight hard too so um assuming you know he hit the guy pretty hard to to be able to do that to his own arm 
but then the second time uh, was actually a little kid. Um, he was uh, probably nine or 10 years old and he went to go kick the other kid. And if you go to do a specific kick without, without turning your bottom foot, uh, you can hurt your knee very badly, even if you're a kid. Um, I mean, obviously children are more flexible. However, uh, this kid went to go kick and he, I just saw it. His knee went in the opposite direction of what it was supposed to. His ankle went all the way up to his hip and he hit the floor and his, his leg was broken. <laughs> and luckily we had, you know, we had paramedics there who could, who could take care of him right on the spot. You know, so those are the, the two worst that I've ever seen <laughs> uh, ever happen in a competition. So it's definitely scary to, to, to see w when it's actually up close and in person. So just very quickly, not to put blame on anybody, but am I right that both those stories essentially are the person had poor technique? And again, I'm not criticizing them. They obviously have far better technique than nobody like me. But Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, like there, obviously, you know, the, the one guy, he, he punched wrong, you know, he punched at an angle going down. So that's, again, it's his own fault. Um, like you said, not to be, not to be ignorant about it, but uh, again, yes, most injuries occur because the other person did the technique uh, wrong or did an improper technique. So Yes. Yes. <laughs> In terms of learning the technique, then, is it completely practical? Like, you know, you watch a demonstrator, literally demonstrate a skill, and then you re repeat it over and over again? Or is, is it like very, you know, you've got textbooks, or like, how does that work? So uh, we do everything by uh, repetition. So basically, what we do is uh, uh, we teach a technique. Uh, for example, like a forward punch, you know? So we, we teach it uh, in a very specific way where, you know, you're, you're hitting with the, with the the front two knuckles and your arm is straight and everything is behind your fist there. So, uh, but uh, the only way you're gonna learn it properly is by practicing it, you know, over and over and over and over again. And with the instructor being there to correct you if you're uh, making any mistakes. So yes, we take one, uh, one technique and we practice it you know hundreds of times before we move on to the next one so so yeah it's, it's kind of like any skill just literally repeat over and over and over have those corrections make them and just repeat 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 right okay cool cool um yeah okay that, that makes a lot of sense so that, that's kind of all my questions for the meantime so harry do you have any more yeah i've got a few more actually uh, the first one, as you said earlier, kind of the, one of the strongest strikes are elbows and side kicks, for example. Right. I know from, from my own experience of failing terribly at trying to learn to strike when I was doing my kind of MMA charity fights, that conditioning your knuckles and conditioning your hands is so important because otherwise it is just ache like crazy. What part <laughs> yes. of your leg do you use um, when you throw kicks and how do you kind of condition and strengthen that? Because I feel like you don't particularly have, maybe kind of you've got the, your calf muscle and your shin, but other than that, I don't really see what there else is to, to use to kind of pad the blow, so to speak. Right. So to uh, for for kicking, hmm. usually uh, there's specific kicks that we do. The main three are we call it front kick. Uh, we have the round kick and then the the side kick. And so if I were to kick. For, uh, for power, like if I had to actually kick somebody, like with the front kick, we kick, we, it's actually with the bottom part of our foot, with the ball of our foot. So you have to learn how to curl your toes back and kick with the ball of your foot or sometimes even your heel, if you can get, get it up that high. Um, same goes for, the, for the, round, the round kick. So in many ways you can kick with your shin, right? Or the top part of your foot. However, if you're kicking something hard, you know, let's say another person, with the top part of your foot, you're going to hurt yourself. So uh, my suggestion would be either the shin or 
or again, curl those to toes back and kick with the ball of your foot. And then for the side kick, um, we turn sideways and we kick with our heel. Um, but yes, but to condition for that, uh, I mean, we have our punching bags, but they're not extremely uh, 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 padded. So they're going to be a little bit tougher to punch and kick. You know, some of them are wrapped in canvas. So it helps with that conditioning. And, you know, same goes for punches. You want your knuckles to be uh, conditioned to, to be able to handle a punch. So how do we do that? We, we practice knuckle push-ups. you know, so like little things like that to condition our bodies to, to be able to uh, make those strikes, make those kicks, and uh, sometimes even to be able to, to take a punch or a kick. So, um, but yeah, so uh, there's a, a lot of training that we go through in that way to, to condition our body to do all that. All right, brilliant. And then one kind of last thing I wanted to kind of ask you about, as you said, it is essentially almost a requirement to, at some point when you get to a certain skill level, move into being an instructor and to help give back and help coach, etc. And you talked about how kind of hugely beneficial that was for you and how it helped you come out of your shell, etc. being an instructor. What was kind of the, if you had, if, um, somebody wanted to become a better coach or somebody wanted to be a school teacher or something like that or to lead a team in business and they're looking to motivate their employees and pass on information is there any few specific uh, techniques or skills you've noticed over your kind of tenure as an instructor that they might find useful so for me uh, repetition is everything I mean the more you get to practice something uh, the more useful it will be in, in, uh, in real life, you know, so I'm, uh, I got really good at teaching a class. Well, first it started with one-on-one -on -one, and then from there a smaller group. And then we move up, you know, to larger and larger groups. And now I'm able to speak to uh, a group of people that I don't even know, or uh, these, you know, personal training clients that I have here at the gym uh, that I've never never meant. Uh, most of them are actually, uh, they're physical therapy patients just coming out of physical therapy uh, to get stronger. However, uh, but most of these people, I don't even know, but it's going to give me the confidence and the ability to, uh, to be able to, to go out of my way to help these people uh, achieve their goals and what they want. So um, again, for me, like I said, it's repetition, just practice and practice and practice. The more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. So <laughs> Yes. The other thing I picked up then as well is you mentioned focusing on helping the other people. So is that something yes. you've noticed as well? Once you have that solid reason why you're doing something, it's so much easier to kind of push through anxiety or pain or tiredness or whatever the obstacle might be. Absolutely. So like you said, like once you have a reason, so my reason is I want to help people uh, learn the things that I can do or uh, mm -hmm. the things that maybe they like here at the uh, personal training, you know, maybe they were in a car accident and they want to be able to, you know, run again. Like after their accident, they, they had to relearn how to walk and now they want to learn how to run. That's where I come in and I want to help that person get better. So yes, uh, just that, that desire to, to help and to teach and to, to give back, it, it, it definitely helps in that way. So, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, have you got any questions for us out of uh, or is there anything in particular you think we maybe haven't spoken about or asked you about that you'd like to discuss um not that i can think of off the top of my head <laughs> but i mean i i appreciate you having me on on your uh on your podcast and and chatting with you guys and i definitely look forward to uh speaking again soon yeah absolutely at the very least in a couple of years when I send you my child and say, yes, him. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's awesome. Okay, cool. So do you have any more questions then, Harry? No, I think we've covered everything. Uh, the, the big thing I kind of wanted to make clear in this podcast for all our viewers and our listeners is that martial arts in my opinion and i'm not an expert by any means obviously but from what i've seen and the people i know who have partaken and taken part it is singularly the best way to become more confident more focused more disciplined to toughen yourself up both physically and mentally in terms of that just resilience 
And I think that we've done a fantastic job. I, I say we, you've done a fantastic job <laughs> of kind of proving to everybody just how truly brilliant it is to be um, and how useful it is to take part, not just in terms of all that stuff, but also the social side of it in terms of the fact that you met your, your wife and you've got a child coming out of all this. It's got something that you and your dad have been doing together. It's just a fantastic avenue that I think more people need to be taking part in. So, yeah, I, I think you've Absolutely. got everything on this podcast that well, I could hope. To thank you so out. much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been great. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. And we'd love to have you on again at some point in the future. So thank you so much, Jeremy, for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you guys for listening to this legal podcast. It's been fantastic from my kind of perspective. I've really enjoyed this. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. That was a lot of fun. <laughs>